Eric, vamos a usar este micrófono, ¿ok? Apaga el otro. Okay. So Eric, are we ready? He's on. He's on. Okay. okay. Very good. Uh, vamos a empezar el Facebook Live hoy. La te el tema es bastante importante. El tema de hoy es el cáncer de colon. Eh, un cáncer bastante, bastante agresivo, pero que si está diagnosticado a temprano, eh, tiene un chance muy, muy buen para tener un curo uh, ah. el paciente. Así que we have colon cancer today. Eh, I'm going to have Dr. J Desai on the line. Is he on the line? Dr. J, uh, this is Dr. Nacruz. Can you hear me? Hi, hi, how are you? Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, uh, I was talking a little bit today about uh, colon cancer. We have talked previously about colon cancer. Dr. J, if you could give our listeners, which are listening to you from all over the United States and uh, Latino America, a little bit of information about colon cancer. Uh, what do they need to know? How should they go about uh, looking into it and get diagnosed, please? Please. Sure. Absolutely, absolutely. So, in your practice, uh, Dr. Desai, I'm sure yet you have had a lot of experience with patients that come in with uh, family history of colon cancer, uh, with a father, a first-time relative, a mother, a sister, or brother with colon cancer. Um, what is the recommendation when a new patient comes to your office and they are at the age of 50, 51 years old, um, what do you recommend them as far as getting uh, a screening for colonoscopy? Sure, sure. What do you right. So, so you know, the guidelines say, you know, typically we say patients start to have an increased risk of colon cancer and polyps after the age of 50. So, you know, low-risk patients, patients who don't have a family history, um, you know, no new symptoms or anything like that, 50 is usually the magic number uh, that we start talking about screening, and there's a lot of great options for, for screening for colon cancer. In patients who have, you know, some risk factors, and, you know, we could talk about that, but, uh, you know, what you mentioned, uh, for example, like a first-degree relative with colon cancer, like a mother or father or a sibling, uh, we generally screen earlier. And uh, the screening, you know, we usually say, uh, 10 years before the age of your relative who was diagnosed. So, uh, you know, if you had a uh, relative who was diagnosed at 45, then 35 would be uh, a good time to screen. If you had someone who was diagnosed earlier than 50, then, uh, I'm sorry, after 50, then we usually start screening at age 40. But um, these are great questions that, that we, uh, we like to talk about. What kind of diet? Uh, you know, we are talking about uh, we have in our listener base, um, there are a lot of patients that are vegetarians. There are a lot of patients that are, uh, they have a very, very high purine diet. Uh, there's a lot of people that uh, are on both, you know. Um, there are a lot of patients that they say, Dr. Nacruz, I'm totally vegetarian. You know, there's a lot of other patients that say, you know what, Dr. Nacruz, I eat a lot of steak, I eat my barbecue on sure, Sunday, so forth. Sure. What kind of diet predisposes a patient to higher chance of having colon cancer? This, this is a great question, and uh, there's been a lot of research about what sort of lifestyle 
uh, risk factors uh, can increase the risk of colon cancer because people obviously want to be proactive. Um, you know, there are some that are clear risk factors, things like smoking and obesity. Um, however, diet is, is one where there's some mixed data. However, I think most people, when you look at the data, uh, there are certain trends that, that show what are higher risk. And, you know, when you think of the classic Western diet, um, low fiber, high fat diet, lots of red meat. These are the things that tend to be more associated with colon cancer. Excellent, excellent. Now, as far as when it comes to diagnosis, um, I have a lot of patients that they say, Dr. Nacruz, I don't want anybody to touch me. I don't <laughs> like to have a colonoscopy. I don't like to have anything invasive. But they're, I, put, they're, put, uh, they're put down, when you, you know. So, but, you know, still, Alma, the, the, the patient says, I don't want to get touched. I don't sure. want any, anything invasive to have it. There's a lot of patients that are, they don't feel comfortable. What sure. other options are there ra any, th that is not invasive that you recommend sure. the patient to start with? And how sure. sensitive and specific are they? Sure. So, so this is another great question. And, um, you know, just kind of going to that point, uh, especially, you know, directed at, at your, your listeners, you know, the data shows that screening rates in the Hispanic, Hispanic population are lower than that in the general population. And I think part of this is, you know, there are a lot of reasons that could be, but some of it is what you mentioned about some of the not feeling comf comfortable with the invasiveness of, of some of the screening tests like colonoscopy. Um, you know, in terms of screening options, my philosophy is always, the best screening test is the one that the patient will actually do. Uh, you know, while uh, I, my personal belief is that colonoscopy is the best screening test because it has the best uh, detection rate and you can actually prevent colon cancer by removing precancerous polyps uh, before they even have a chance to turn into colon cancer, um, there are lots of other great options. And, um, you know, this runs from uh, non-invasive imaging tests, like uh, special types of CAT scans called CT colonography or virtual colonoscopy, mm -hmm. um, to stool tests, uh, which um, look for different things that can suggest cancer, like either blood in the stool or a new test called Cologuard, uh, which um, looks actually for DNA uh, of colon cancer or, or advanced wow. polyps in the stool. But, um, but does a person, I'm sorry, uh, yeah. that's very interesting. Does a person for that test has to be looking like going to the doctor for that? That's not something that they look on a regular checkup. Right. Right. So exactly. So these aren't, you know, usually routinely done as just a routine physical. They're done as part of a, a screening test. Um, so, you know, if you meet criteria for colon cancer screening, you know, like you're over age 50 uh, or you have high risk factors and you want to do it earlier, you know, your doctor and you would talk about it because every test has risks and benefits and different pros and cons in terms of how sensitive they are. For example, these stool tests are not as sensitive as colonoscopy for detecting colon, uh, colon cancer, and they can also have false positives. Um, but again, you know, the best screening test is, a pa is one that a patient will do. If they're not comfortable doing colonoscopy, it's always best to do a different screening test that they are comfortable with. Excellent, excellent. So here's uh, now the scenario, and I'm sure you've dealt a lot in your patient bases in your office in Manhattan. You have a patient that has already had the colonoscopy, and unfortunately, there is a diagnosis of a small polyp. What is the next step, and what's the scenario? What 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 do you do in that scenario? Uh, you send the polyp for pathology, and what's the next step? Sure. So, um, you know, when you're doing a colonoscopy and you're looking inside and you see something that looks like a polyp, like a little growth, uh, we remove them. And the reason we remove them is because by removing polyps, uh, these are the type of lesions that go on to develop into colon cancer in the future. So you actually can prevent colon cancer. So when you remove a polyp, if it's a small polyp, the patient, you know, they don't feel anything. They, there's no nerve endings in that area, so they don't feel anything. And we send it to our lab, and the doctor looks at it under the microscope, and they uh, make a diagnosis of what, what they're looking at. And if they're just a benign polyp, there are many different types of benign polyps, that uh, tells us as the gastroenterologist, um, you know, what their risk is 
uh, and when they should have their next test, which in general is somewhere if they have a polyp, somewhere around five years. Okay, very good. So based on the result of the colonoscopy, you're being you're going to be able to let them know when their next follow up colonoscopy is. Is that right? Exact, exactly. And exactly. if there is more than one or two polyps removed, what are the recommendations in that point? Is that sure. does that mean that they have to get a colonoscopy sooner? Um, yes, so that's that's true. So in general, if patients have multiple polyps, then that's a suggestion that they probably are higher risk in general for colon cancer. So if they have multiple polyps of a certain type, uh, that puts them in a higher risk category, and then we do their next screening test a little bit sooner, sometimes three years, sometimes five years. Very, very good. Dr. Desai, do, is there any specific blood test? For example, I have patient that says, Dr. Nacruz, um, there are tests for ovarian cancer. There are genetic tests for breast cancer. There are genetic tests for uterine cancer. Uh, is there any specific genetic test that we could check that could give us a better idea if somebody is more likely to develop colon cancer? Yeah, so, so there's two things. So there's no blood test currently available that can detect colon cancer in a patient. There are you know, some other things that are available if you already have colon cancer to follow it, but there's no accurate, reliable blood test for colon cancer at this time. Now, um, in certain patients who have a strong family history of colon cancer, you know, their fathers and their uh, grandparents and multiple people have had colon cancer, some of them have a genetic condition that increases their risk of colon cancer. Mm -hmm. Now, there are different genetic tests that can determine uh, if, if, you know, the patient it does have that, which would increase their risk. And it's a, basically the evaluation for that would involve going to a genetics counselor and some blood work and taking a very detailed family history. Excellent, excellent. So there are some available tests that we do have to follow up on patients' colon cancer. There are some genetic tests that they could also do to see whether if, if they're more likely predisposed to it based on other family history of colon cancer right. that they have that the right. patient has. Exactly. Now, exactly. Yeah. here's my second question that I have. And the second question is, let's say you have diagnosed a patient with colon cancer. What is the next step? Yeah. So this is also a great question. So um, the reason screening is so important um, uh, is one, because colon cancer in general doesn't have symptoms, which is a common uh, misconception of patients. You know, they don't want to get screening because they're say, oh, I don't have abdominal pain or I don't have blood in the stool. But most colon cancers don't have symptoms. And so it's so important to get screened because uh, the stage of the colon cancer is really what determines how patients are going to do. So if you look at five-year survival rates uh, compared of patients who are diagnosed with colon cancer early, uh, in stage one when the cancer is very localized just to that area, um, generally patients do fantastic. You know, they have a five-year survival rate of over 92%. Um, and if you catch it early and you remove it uh, by a surgery, um, you know, that's really all you have to do. You know, in general, you're, you're done at that stage. Um, however, if the diagnosis is made later on when the cancer is in an advanced stage, when it's spread to potentially other areas like stage 4 colon cancer, the survival rate drops to 11%. So mm -hmm. there, there's such a huge difference in outcomes based on when you're diagnosed, which makes, again, screening so important. Very good. Um... Has it ever been uh, that once you diagnose them with colon cancer, do you usually send them to a follow-up with a cancer specialist or do you recommend chemotherapy? Sure. What do you recommend? Radiation, surgery? Right. Because I have a lot of patients that they sure. you know, that they say, you know what, Dr. Nichols, I don't want chemotherapy. Right. I'd rather do the surgery. What is your recommendation based on pathological finding? Sure. So... It's totally dependent on the stage of the disease. So if you have colon cancer that's diagnosed early, either stage one or two, meaning either localized right to the colon or just around the colon, um, the diagnosis, so the next step is almost always uh, surgery in the sense that you resect, you remove that area of the colon that has uh, the tumor. And the reason they do that is because 
during the surgery, they look at the lymph nodes um, right around that area, and that's how they make a final staging of, of how, how far advanced this colon cancer is. Um, if it's early stage, um, like stage one or early stage two, um, that's it. You're done. There, there's generally not recommended any chemotherapy afterwards or any radiation, which is generally not part of it. Um, if it's later, like stage three, um, then patients are generally recommended to have chemotherapy after the, the surgery. Um, and then it gets a little trickier with stage four, which is once it's moved beyond the colon to the uh, other areas, then you have to determine what the best step is. And sometimes it's chemotherapy, sometimes it's other other uh, interventions. Now, in general, though, if you have a colon cancer that's diagnosed, uh, surgery is generally the first step. Yes. If the if the cancer is in the rectum, it gets a little different. I understand. Now, um, a lot of patients also come to me, and there is a misunderstanding between colon cancer and rectal cancer. Sure. Can you, while we have you on the show today, can you explain a little bit about rectal cancer, some of the pathologies behind it? And how do you usually go about diagnosing that sure. and the treatment of that? Sure. So, so rectal cancer is similar to colon cancer in that you know it's part of the last part of the GI tract. Um, the pathology can look very similar, and they they act very similarly. Um, the main differences for patients is that rectal cancer can be more challenging to treat uh, based on their location because the rectum is so important to patients in terms of their quality of life, in terms of uh, their ability to have continence, you know, uh, have bowel movements on their own, mm-hmm. and um, in addition. Uh, surgeries that involve the rectum are much more complicated. And uh, depending on a lot of factors, you know, where in the rectum and what stage in the rectum, the treatments are very different and the surgeries are different. Mm-hmm. Sometimes uh, they involve uh, also the addition of radiation, which is generally not part of colon cancer management. I understand. Thank you so much. Now, as far as when it comes to colon cancer and rectal cancer combined, are there chemotherapy pills that we have. So for example, a patient says, you know, I have colon cancer. Uh, the doctor has put me on, already started me on chemotherapy, but they also want to put me on the pills. Have you seen any patients with pills that they're using as far as chemotherapy? And what do you think about the new genetic uh, modulators or injections that are coming out, for example, for lung cancer, for brain cancer and so forth and so on, and do you see anything on the horizon for colon cancer? Sure, sure. So, uh, in general, for uh, stage two B and three uh, colon cancer, where you do uh, chemotherapy afterwards to reduce the risk of it coming back, mm-hmm. uh, in general, pills are not part of that for chemotherapy. It's 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 not a pill-based chemotherapy. Um, for late stage colon cancer, where uh, it's a little harder to treat. Sometimes there are some pill-based uh, chemotherapies. Um, in terms of uh, what you asked about, uh, you know, some of these new treatments based on uh, genetic testing and antibodies, um, some of these for some of these other cancers that you've seen, there actually have been some studies lately about uh, stage four colon cancer, which we would used to think are really poor outcomes, uh, that there may be some responsiveness to these new therapies. They're still very early Mm -hmm. uh, in clinical trial stages and whatnot, but um, I think it's really exciting and um, certainly has the potential to help with more late-stage colon cancer diagnoses, which, you know, as I say before, tend to have overall not as good outcomes. Very good. So, Dr. Desai, in a nutshell, for all of our audience who are listening, and they are above 50 years old, and those that have strong family history of colon cancer. What is your recommendation? You tell them today, you say, I recommend this, I recommend the following. What is your recommendation to those people who are listening today? Sure. So, so first off, thanks again for having me on this show, uh, Dr. Nacruz. Um, and what I would say to the patients, uh, you know, regarding what you just asked, uh, if you're over 50 and you've never had any colon cancer screening, regardless of your family history, uh, it's, it's such a great test to get some form of screening for colon cancer because this is a very preventable, col- uh, 
type of cancer and a very treatable cancer at an early stage. So, you know, I would strongly recommend, um, you know, whichever uh, screening test uh, that, that works for you, whether it's colonoscopy or virtual colonoscopy or stool testing, whichever works for you, uh, some testing is better than no testing because um, if you detect these things early, uh, the outcomes are really great. And, and, so, and especially if you have a strong family history, uh, I, I, I couldn't emphasize enough the importance of screening. Very good. Thank you so much, Dr. Desai. I appreciate your time and uh, hopefully talk to you soon. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Have a great day. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, allá tenemos uh, nuestro gastroenterólogo, Dr. J. Desai, uno de los buenos gastroenterólogos que tenemos. Eh, la recomendación para todo que escuchen, bastante importante, hay que tomar todas esas informaciones al corazón, porque al último de minuto le va a ayudar, le va a servir. Colon cáncer es un cáncer que si está diagnosticado temprano, si está diagnosticado en el estadio, stage, en el estado primero o el estado segundo, es muchísimo más fácil de tratar y de curar que está tarde. Colon cáncer, cuando una persona puede hacer simplemente una colonoscopía y sacar el polip y allá termina la cosa sin cirugía, sin quimioterapia, sin radiación, es muchísimo más fácil para el paciente para la familia, para todas personas que pueden estar afectadas con esa enfermedad tan, tan mortal. El cáncer de colon, ahora como el doctor J. Desai dijo, es el segundo cáncer más común en Estados Unidos, unfortunately. Tiene que hacer mucho con factores genéticos, tiene que hacer mucho con factores environmentales, tiene que hacer mucho con lo que comemos estos días, con tantos toxins, tantos hormonas que están en el, nuestra comida estas hoy, alcohol, fumar, cigarettes, todo eso que estamos usando hoy está uno de las causas más importantes de cáncer de colon. Y un cáncer que podemos tratar tan, tan fácilmente. Doctor Desai también le dijo, importante para las personas que tienen antecedentes de familias. Por ejemplo, Eric, tú tienes una amiga, la amiga tiene cáncer de colon a la edad 40, importante para que todos los hijos de ella o de ellos puedan estar checados a la edad 30, importante. Tú tienes una papá que fue diagnosticado a la edad 52, tú tienes que fue, eh, estar checado a la edad 42. First time family is very, very important when it comes. Same thing with breast cancer, si tú recuerdas, yo le dijo hace unas semanas el BRCA testing. El genetic BRCA testing, que una paciente, su mamá, tiene cáncer del pecho a la edad 38, 40. Muy importante que se hace un BRCA testing. Eh, fácil. Le va al ginecólogo, le va al genético. Eh, so, todas esas informaciones 